is Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium. And today I'm talking with Dr. Wando Oleiwola, who is our 2008 FMEC Emerging Leader Award winner. And she will also be one of the plenary speakers at our 2018 FMEC annual meeting in Rybrook, New York. Dr. Oleiwola, thank you for joining with us. Thank you so much for having me. So if it's okay with you, uh, you've given me permission before when we're talking to uh, call you by your first name, uh, Wando. And if that's okay, that's the way I'll continue. That's absolutely fine. Thank you. Great. So can you describe your path? Where did you go to medical school, residency, and then what's happened over the last 10 years since uh, you uh, became our Emerging Leader Award winner that year? Yeah, well, it's it's, it's amazing to me that it's been 10 years uh, since I was I received that Emerging Leader Award, and so much has happened since then. So, um, yeah, I'll definitely start uh, in terms of about my journey. So I went to medical school at the Ohio State University and Cleveland Clinic Foundation in, in Columbus in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, and thoroughly enjoyed family medicine uh, and also enjoyed the many of the other rotations that I did and felt like I went into family medicine because I really didn't want to give up any part of the life cycle or any particular population of patients. And so in choosing family medicine residencies, I, I was looking for an urban family medicine experience and ultimately went to the Columbia Presbyterian Family Medicine Residency Program in New York and Northern Manhattan and got a fantastic experience in the, the breadth and the depth of family medicine while there. When I finished that program, I went to the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School for a fellowship uh, in minority health policy that was uh, sponsored by the Commonwealth Fund to engage uh, family physicians, oh, sorry, physicians who were interested in health policy and public health, and particularly around uh, making impact on minority communities and reducing health disparities. So I did that fellowship uh, and also master's in public health and health policy and management. Uh, at that time, and finished that program, tried to figure out how I was going to connect all of these dots uh, that were, were of interest to me in my career, and ultimately uh, chose to go work in a community health center as a family doctor uh, in Connecticut after my fellowship program. And it was in that uh, time, I was there for eight years altogether. Five of those years, I was the chief medical officer of the whole network, but Prior to that, uh, just getting a lot of experience as a full-scope family physician, working alongside a number of other primary care providers, and trying to figure out how I could make the system better for people that were delivering care in the system, like myself and my colleagues, but also for the patients that were receiving care. So that's that's how I got started, um, and it was in, in the course of that work um, at the Community Health Center, Inc., where I was in Connecticut for many years that I actually got the Emerging Leader Award from the FMEC. So it's, it's so great to, to be back talking to everybody at 10 years. That's wonderful. So what were your career hopes at, at that point? What, what did you see yourself doing? What kind of impact did you see yourself having across the uh, course of your career? Yeah. Well, I knew for sure that I wanted to uh, – to represent family medicine very well. I, I was, I had always found it very odd when I'd be in conversations with, with people in, in residency or fellowship or even in medical school that would wonder, you know, why would I go into family medicine? Or, you know, I heard things like, oh, you're too smart to go into family medicine or too smart to go into primary care. So I also, I absolutely felt like it was important to uh, represent the, the field and the, the specialty very well and hope that I would, I would do that. Uh, but I also, you know, wanted to make sure that my career would have um, a, a great degree of impact on marginalized, vulnerable, um, and otherwise disenfranchised populations. And I wasn't quite sure, and I, 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 I definitely wouldn't say that in, in 2008 I knew exactly what that would look like and how that would play out. Um, I would be dishonest if I said that. But I, I, I did know that I want to make a big impact. I want to be able to have um, access to tools and resources and people and minds that 
will will help me in that quest to improve care for for marginalized populations and and do it a way that in a way that was meaningful and respectful. And so I'd hope that whatever I did would stay true to that that larger vision for for my career. Uh, and you know, wanted to just bring people up as well and be a mentor to budding family family doctors and primary care providers and um, people that were already on the journey but needed some guidance in their careers. So I wanted to make sure that I always had a mentoring focus as well. Great. And how would you describe yourself as a leader and how have you been able to use your leadership skills and abilities? I would say I'm a, I'm a very inclusive leader. I think that all the hallmark of all my leadership uh, uh, roles, I've had consecutive leadership roles really since I took on the, uh, I started working at Community Health Center. Uh, so I've been medical director, I've been a director of health policy, a chief medical officer, a director of a center at University of California, San Francisco, a, a, a physician, faculty in the family medicine department. So I've had a number of different leadership roles and in my current role as a, a, a chief level um, executive at a health tech startup, and I would say the the one of the hallmarks of my of my leadership style is really uh, being inclusive, because I I I realize that uh, you know even if I'm a mentor to someone and seemingly have more experience than them in whatever it is that I'm mentoring them about, they might have experiences in other areas that I that I don't have, and you're constantly in a phase of you know giving but also getting and 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 you know imparting but also receiving. And so I, um, I I like to be very inclusive and, and have a lot of voices at the table, particularly when you're thinking about innovations or strategies that, that affect the lives of patients in their real lives. And there is no one, I have not seen it yet, but there is no one uh, cookie mold that fits every consumer of healthcare. And so, you know, people are grouped into different, you know, um, segments based on a number of different things, but they are very, very different and unique in their identity. So the, to the extent that you can have the highly representative and inclusive leadership uh, strategy and approach, you can get more voices and get a better idea of where you're supposed to be focused on. And then the other thing that I would say is that I've tried to be very inspirational. And I know that a lot of times, particularly when I'm, I'm talking to people who are earlier in their career or on their career path towards family medicine, or in any of the primary care specialties, I know a lot of times that they get a lot of doubt uh, put in their heads and, uh, you know, you're too smart, you're not going to make enough money, you know, don't you want to be focused on one thing, you're going to be a jack of all trades, a master of none, like all those kind of things. And so I think it's also very important as a leader to inspire and encourage people uh, to be their best. And, and for me, I feel like I've done a good job as a leader if the people that I am leading are growing and they're developing professionally and they're building confidence and they're identifying their, their next steps and they, they feel like they're becoming successful in whatever they're doing. Great. So you've clearly done a, a lot um, academically to prepare yourself uh, for leadership with the uh, various programs that you've completed. What other things do you do uh, to help develop yourself your, uh, that stimulates your growth as a leader? I, I um, follow and pay attention to and listen to a number of people that are, that are leaders and have, uh, have built careers in leadership. I also find it really rewarding to have very strong mentoring relationships. I have some fantastic mentors who have been really essential in my thinking about my career and pivots that I've made in my career and um, supporting some of the different uh, thoughts I've had or, 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 or having me think differently about certain decisions that, that come up. And so I think the value of mentorship has been really, really important. Um, and then also I feel like it's, it's, you know, this, it serves a couple of purposes, but I also write a lot. And I, I think that writing for me has been, almost therapeutic, but also a way for me to really synthesize thoughts and codify them so that maybe somebody else could potentially use them. And so that ends up showing up. I mean, even as, since I was a kid, you know, writing poetry and short stories and different, you know, things about things that I was experiencing and, um, or, or, or seeing or, or worried about or bothered about, uh, you know, using that as, as, a, as an outlet to do that. But then, you know, as, as I've grown, it's also been, you know, in a, 
medical scientific writing and, and peer reviewed research, but also uh, you know commentaries, opinion pieces, uh, blogs, um, books, and and those are the things that that I think really help to uh, help me think through what, what are what are my ideas, what are my thoughts, and how would I package them so somebody else could could also you know share and and, and learn take anything from them. So you've written a number of books, which I've had the uh, uh, pleasure of uh, purchasing. Do you want to mention to folks the, the titles of um, some of your books? Absolutely, yeah. So my very first book uh, is called Half Woman. I actually wrote that. I started a little bit of it in, in undergraduate, but really, really wrote most of it and, and finished it when I was in medical school. And that book uh, was um, talks about a woman um, in southeastern Nigeria and some of the perils that she experiences uh, by not having a male child and was designed to to uncover uh, and, and, and have people have a dialogue around some of the social stigmas around uh, women and, and the way they can be uh, marginalized by not having barren male children. And it was really illuminating for me to, to write that because it was inspired by an experience of my, my, my aunt, my paternal aunt, um, and and really um, was able to tell a story that of an experience that happens to a lot of women and have people think really differently about how we approach and blame uh, women for 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 that situation. So that was that was a really exciting book uh, for me to write. And then I didn't uh, publish anything for a number of years. That was that was 2001. And then my my I've I've had three books in the last six years. So 24 20 or last um uh, four years I guess. So 2014 I published a book called Medicine is Not a Job. And um, that book was really inspired by a talk I was asked to give to a room of about 300, 250, 300 high school students that were interested in going into healthcare uh, and, and many of them into medicine. And they had asked me to talk about my career and how I decided and how I stay in, in healthcare when they were hearing a lot about burnout and, and things like that in medicine. And so uh, that book really talked about, you know, really finding uh your calling in medicine and, and, and how to know that you have it and is, is really more designed for people that are thinking about careers or early in their careers and, 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 um, and maybe two people that are in them and still, you know, question why they're there. So really, really excited about that one. And then uh, in 2016, I, I published another book, which had been kind of brewing in me for a while, but uh, it's called Minority Women Professionals Are MVPs and uh, as the most valuable players. And, and it, it it's almost like a, a motivational book that has 10 key things that I've seen in my career and the careers of my friends, colleagues, family members, women who are professionals in, in not just in, in medicine, but in a number of other different um, professions and talks about their, um, the things that I've seen in common or heard from them in common that have been essential to their success um, and their growth as minority women. And those are women that, uh, you know, claim any kind of identity-based disadvantage, um, race, ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic um, deprivation, uh, uh, age, gender identity, sexual orientation, and just really women with disability, people that have some kind of, uh, some some part of their identity is uh, is makes them a minority. And, and, and for some, it's like women in tech, so what, like me, right? Women who are leaders in tech. Um, we're not, you know, maybe by virtue, minority is more a reflection of where you are and the, the field that you're in. So, so giving it um, almost a call to action and a celebration of 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 what it takes to 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 be successful with with that background um, has been really exciting and um, um, was was written after I had an idea to have a conference, a national conference program that would bring women together. I decided to write a book to kind of give it a framework. So that's where that one came, and then. My most recent one, which was just released in July of 2018, is called uh, Papaya Head. And Papaya Head uh, is a, a, a biographical book, really, and a series of short stories that talks about my experience and those experiences of my siblings and I as growing up as first-generation um, Americans from an immigrant family from Nigeria and, and a lot of the different phases that we went through or are continuing to go through um, as we straddle different cultures. And it's supposed to also be a story about, you know, how does a first generation child kind of make their way to adulthood and what are some of the, the struggles that they might experience um, and the isms that they might experience 
you know, whether it's racism or gender, you know, discrimination or xenophobia or other, just being another, um, and ultimately come to a place where, you know, you're content with, with who you are. So that's what that, what that book covers. And so all of those books are available on, on Amazon. And um, I, I love being able to write and, and tell my own stories and stories of other people um, through, through books. So I'm going to let the listeners know, especially those who are coming to our meeting in, um, in Rybrook, New York in November, that we have a book signing uh, and, with the authors uh, sitting by a desk, folks can purchase their their books on site that Saturday after the lunch, and um, uh, I think people will be excited to uh, get a signed copy. Um, I'm I'm enjoying reading the the books, and and I um, I'm impressed, quite honestly, with uh, all that you're doing and you're uh, figuring out uh, how to um, produce books at, at the rate that you're going, uh, pretty impressive. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly looking forward to being able to share this at the conference as well. So thank you for the opportunity. Oh, we're, we're happy that you, you're going to join us. So what effect did receiving the FMEC Emerging Leader Award have on your development as a leader? Well, first of all, it was incredibly important to me uh, that I was recognized by my, you know, my home base of in family medicine uh, as a leader. And I would say on the one hand, it was great and, 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 and an honor um, and gratifying to be uh, distinguished that way by my group, but also made me realize, you know, you better do something, <laughs> you know, do something that, that makes them proud because uh, they extended a, a, you know, a, an immense amount of confidence in, in me, and I, I really wanted to make sure that um, you all felt happy with your selection. And so that that was incredibly, incredibly important to me. And so I've tried, you know, since then um, to to keep in mind that people are looking and 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 wanting to see what what does she make of this of this story and this opportunity that she's been given. And I've tried to you know be a, a positive force for family medicine. Um, in education, in, in policy, in, in you know clinical medicine and in, in, in technology, just be a positive force for, for family medicine wherever I can be, uh, and and continue to be proud about being a family doctor and and be proud of of the the training that I've had that has prepared me for such a, a diverse uh, and, and non traditional career. Um, for the for the relationship that it's allowed me to build with patients and their families um, over generations, and to be able to kind of continue to embody all that family medicine is, um, remembering that uh, if you if you if you consider me emerging ten years ago, you'll certainly want to know what I've done since then. Well, I have to say honestly, I'm I'm pretty impressed. Ten years, um, I'm curious really what the next 10 years is going to uh, look like. Uh, you're, you're just still getting your sea legs, uh, as they say. So it's really pretty impressive. I'm wondering if you have any recommendations or suggestions for other family physicians who are emerging as leaders. Yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, one thing I would say is, you know, if you if you've responded to that call uh, to go into family medicine and to become a family family doctor, you know, try to remember what that call felt like because there will be times where it will will be hard and your your commitment to the field will be challenged and your your commitment to kind of a larger ethos around primary care will be challenged and so you've got to have something that keeps you grounded um, in in that space. So so just try to remember what that original call felt like and why you're in it at all. The other thing I would say is to really, really try and find mentors because, uh, you know, a lot of the, the best decisions that I've made um, have been because I've had people that have, that have pushed me to, to excellence and have, you know, encouraged me or saw something in me that I might not have really seen myself. And, you know, I remember having a conversation with my, one of my mentors who uh, was my family medicine um, uh, the head of family medicine at Columbia when I did my residency and who's remained 
a very, very important mentor in my life. And it was a, something I was considering and, and said to her, but I'm kind of scared. I, I don't think, you know, I, this might be too big, you know, too big of a thing for me, you know, at this age. And she was so supportive and just said, if anybody can do it, you can, right? If anybody can do it, you can. And it, and it was just that, you know, confidence in someone that had, you know, known me since I was training and, and has been part of my life since that really kind of gave me the push to go forward with it. And so I think being sure that you've got mentors around you that will not just kind of, you know, pad whatever you're you're telling them, but also push you, challenge you, you know, have you think about your direction and, and your, your vision is really, really important. So a final question for you. Uh, you've alluded to the, the uh, company, the tech company that you're currently working with. Uh, you're a family physician working within the tech world. Do you want to talk about that company and what you're doing? Sure, yeah. I'm working with a company called Rubicon MD, which is an e-consult, electronic consultation uh, platform that provides um, a bridge between primary care and specialty care providers um, that are consulting on patient-related uh, 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 conditions and, and cases. And I actually got into the e-consult world when I was a, a, a chief medical officer at my community health center and set up Connecticut's first e-consult program in partnership with the University of Connecticut and the first telemedicine um, program in an FQHC in Connecticut um, in partnership with Yale. And I had done that because I had recognized this really, really um, awful reality that patients that we were seeing that were largely Medicaid um, insured or uninsured had a, a very tremendous um, difficulty being able to access specialty care and largely by virtue of their um, their their at their geography, their socioeconomics, et cetera. And so I wanted, you know, a response and had seen some really exciting work that had been coming out of California um, and felt like I wanted to really replicate the, the e-consult um, telemedicine work in Connecticut. So had been really engaged in this work for a, quite a long time before this role. And in the years in between kind of setting up those programs in, um, in Connecticut almost a decade ago, I uh, I ended up um, you know transitioning over to University of California San Francisco and 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 heading up the Center for Excellence in Primary Care and working really hard to continue this work around what I started to call like the the, the larger medical neighborhood integration and seeing electronic consults as a really great way of integrating and and strengthening the medical neighborhood. So uh, you know I you know and that and then that role I was doing work on implementing e consults, providing technical assistance to public um, hospitals county hospital systems that were trying to implement e-consult as a technical advisor through a number of grant grant funding initiatives. Um, also research on e-consult and impact on provider experience and patient experience and specialist experience. Um, and then policy work in the e-consult space. And so now joining the tech company about a year and a half ago uh, that actually provides the e-consult and the specialists that do the e-consult has just been fascinating because I feel like I've Touch the innovation from so many different angles, research, policy, implementation, technical assistance, you know, all those, but uh, really being on the tech side of the innovation has been fascinating. And to really see what is behind the work that goes into a technology company as they're trying to do something, which is an innovation that I believe in and have seen have impact in underserved populations, but also being able to provide my own lens as a family doctor and a primary care physician, how do you actually um, – provide your thoughts and guidance to a health tech company so that they can make a product that is more streamlined for the the providers that are going to use it, that is uh, more, you know, um, uh, efficient in, in the use, clinically uh, engaged. So I, I do my work as a chief clinical transformation officer is helping to figure out how do we prepare a clinical environment to be able to use technology successfully and not just give people, you know, a login ID and password and have them go try to use it, but really think about how will this impact their workflows? Where will this impact their workflows? How do we set, you know, goals around what success will look like? How do we, you know, start small and spread and do PDSA cycles and applying quality improvement strategies to the implementation? And being able to do that, um, you know, combining, you know, obviously a, a great passion for technology and innovation with uh, a lot of experience in, in clinical transformation and practice redesign bringing those two together has been fascinating. And so I, I would say to any family um, physician that is thinking about 
this and not seen many family physicians in this space, that uh, it's very, very doable and we're very, very necessary. So I hope that we can have more of us kind of starting to build momentum and, and, and lending our expertise in this area. So I want to thank you, Wando, for uh, taking the time and talking with us today. And perhaps this message, when people hear it, will inspire some uh, other family physicians, some medical students, some residents, perhaps, who uh, are on their uh, path to family medicine. But they also have uh, a fascination or curiosity about the technology end of things. So I want to thank yeah. you very much for joining with us today. And I, I look forward to seeing you uh, this November. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I, I look forward to seeing you soon, too.